Today we're going to introduce pricing. And pricing is something that I think is one of the most poorly done pieces uh, by entrepreneurs. Oftentimes we kind of arbitrarily pick a price. It's going to be $5, it's going to be $6, just kind of based on what competitors are charging, based on what we think customers are going to pay. And we make that decision somewhat arbitrarily. Uh, the difference of selling your product for $5 versus selling it for $6 is the difference of approximately 20% in your profit margin. So in that way, when you look at that in aggregate, and when you look at what are things I can do to grow my profit margin by 20%, pricing your product $1 more might be the thing that makes that happen. Uh, so in that context, we're gonna look at pricing, and we're gonna recognize that it's not something that is easily done, and it's something that deserves your thought and your attention. A few key considerations to ask when you're thinking about pricing is first, what are the key issues in this dynamic environment? What is the pricing strategy uh, that makes sense for me, and how is that going to change over time? You want also to think about key considerations prior to setting prices. So in that way, you want to understand the different aspects that are influencing your expenses, both fixed and variable, and what price you need to charge, as well as what happens if competitor prices change. There's also the question of after sales. So do you have the type of product that's a single product sale and the price you charge is the only revenue you're going to generate for that customer? Or is there other opportunities to extract revenue and to what extent does that change what your pricing strategy should be? And then lastly, we want to think about when should the specific pricing strategies be used? When should sales? When should promotions? When should other incentives be employed, if at all, for your venture? What we see particularly for high-tech products is it's not all about what's it cost to manufacture. You might have spent months or years trying to design and develop the technology and all of that is cost. All of that R&D you need to recover in your revenues and in your price. What you see too is that things change very quickly. So the pace of change is quite high. And there is also an economy of scale consideration, this unit one cost, and that when you're doing prototyping and when you're doing small dozens or hundreds, it costs a lot to make that. And you need to recover those costs in time as well as you grow up and scale in the future products. For a app, what's it cost to have an app built? 10,000, 15,000, it depends. What's in the app? What's in the app? So I have a recent alumni that's developed an app called Manny Diaries, M-A-N-I. Manny, okay. Manny Diaries. Like manicure. And it's a site that you can post your manicure on and you can review and rate different manicuring locations. Cost money? No, free site, ad supported. What did she pay to have Manny Diaries built? A couple hundred dollars. No. About thirty grand. Thirty grand. Is she making money on it? No. Did she get any sort of return? It's ads. So you make some. But to my knowledge, and again, it's been a little bit of time since I've spoken with her. 30 grand. We think apps are free and or cheap, but they take some time. Just like websites. We think websites are cheap, but depending on what they do, they take some time. So recognize, too, that you want to be very acquainted before you start building your product and before you set your pricing of what your costs are and how you're going to recover those costs. And in that way too, when you think about cost, if she did Manny Diaries <coughs> 2, if she did Petty Diaries, what should that cost? <coughs> Dramatically less. Arguably, it would cost the time of let me do a fine and replace on my 
out the change Manny to Petty, and it's all the same. So in that way, you might have some things where there's a big upfront cost, but then as you do subsequent iterations of that, it costs less. What you also might find is that the price of your product is going to go down over time. Why do we see the prices of technology, of laptops, of flat screen televisions, and so forth, go down dramatically? Because there are, like, the parts of it are becoming cheaper. To you begin to see that as new technologies emerge, more competitors enter the market, there's some economies of scale in the manufacturing, there's some advancement in the technology. And my 32-inch flat panel TV that I can get today for $300 or $600 three years ago and $1,000 three years before that and $5,000 five years before that. So recognize, too, that particularly if you're working in a technology space, that it's going to get cheaper to produce over time if you produce the same thing. If you're going to improve, there's going to be cost of that as well. Competition certainly drives pricing. And in that way, with each subsequent competitor, they may very well try and beat you on price. And as we've heard before, that's a tough game to get in. It gets to be a little bit of a race to the bottom of who's willing to make the least amount of money to stay in business. Alternatively, you can do other things. There's a hardware store in D.C., Frager's Hardware, that has survived the Lowe's and the Home Depot's and the Walmart's. How do you survive as a local hardware store these days? It's not price. You pay more. Exact same thing, you pay more. They don't have the economies of scale. They aren't buying 100,000 hammers a month. <clears throat> well, you said it's in D.C., like in the city, there's not very many like, Lowe's and Home Depot. Okay. There's a location, but there are Home Depots two miles away. So in that way, if you're going to get in your car anyway to go several blocks, to go an extra mile or two, it's not problematic. So how do you survive? Maybe better customer service? It's largely customer service. And it's largely people coming in and saying, this is what I'm trying to do. And it's people that will literally walk you through and say, you need one of these and two of these and six of those. Try this one and that one. And they try and make it up on service. And for many companies that can't compete on price, there has to be some level of service that they're delivering as their differentiator, where people are willing to pay more because they are getting more in the terms of service. Now, customers also ultimately dictate a lot of the pricing. It's how they perceive the values and the benefits of what's there. And it's the function of the product, the operations of the product, what my financing options are. I can't sell you a cell phone and a data plan for $2,000 a day or $2,000 two day. But if I break it up over 24 payments over two years, you'll buy it. It's more affordable. It's somewhat the industry norm. There's also this element of cost and recognizing that there's monetary cost, but there's also a non-monetary cost. When iTunes launched at their 99 cent per song, you could arguably find most, if not all, of those 99 cent songs on Napster for free. How do you compete with free? The fact that we 
the fact that iTunes was actually like a legal way of getting music. Okay. There might have been people that recognized the illegality of pirating, that given an affordable and convenient alternative, would rather pay for it than steal it. How else do you compete with free? Well, most of the free music I download doesn't have the same quality as <coughs> music I pay There might be a quality element of let's make sure we are delivering something of high quality, the bit rates, the fidelity, all of those elements. What else does it have to be? Um, well, some of the songs you buy on iTunes will have an album cover. You might have some level of added features, so you get the album cover. When it comes up on your phone, you kind of see it there. I think the main thing is the hassle, because okay. when you buy it on your iPod, you just click a button, it automatically gets downloaded. It's a hassle-free element. You have some expectancy that it's going to work. It's not a, oh, I downloaded it, and I only got the beginning, or the end, or it was garbled, or somebody decided that they wanted to customize it and talk during it. So, And that way, again, there's a hassle element that you avoid. And you get some more flexibility if you download it on your uh, computer. It's also available on your uh, phone. So there's some syncing that goes on across the iTunes platforms as well. So they've added value. They've added benefit, much of those non-monetary, in the f how it looks, how it feels, how you use it. There's also some element of recognizing reference pricing in the sense of what they've spent before. So keep this in mind as you're introducing a product. Hard to sell a $10 app. Even if your app forecasted what the price of a stock was going to be 10 seconds from now, and if I knew that, I could make millions of dollars a day, a lot of people would see a $10 app and say, well, wait a minute. That's a $10 app. Why? Because most apps aren't ten dollars. Because we've been conditioned that most apps should be a dollar or two. So recognize for your consumers, your your customers for your product, you might deliver great value, and it might be a lot better than what they've seen before, but they also are going to be in some fashion conditioned or biased to what they've spent for that type of thing before. So you have to do an if you're going to charge a lot more or a lot different, you want to be sure you educate them appropriately. There's also a cost of ownership to think about as well, of when you buy something. If I buy an electric scooter, what's going to happen in a few years to that scooter? Battery might die. What do I do then? What do I do with my electric Scooter's battery dies. Buy a new battery. I buy a new battery. Is that fair? Yes. They, never told us about they never told me you have a 100-year warranty. Your battery's going to last forever. And again, most things have a warranty. So if it went out in a year and it should have lasted three, you probably would replace that or replace it in part. But there's an expectancy of recognizing there's price, and then there's follow-on costs that people may have as well. And you may play a role in selling them some of those replacements or follow-on solutions or not, but recognize that piece too. When you're thinking about pricing strategies, there's an element of orienting the price towards the customer based on the value they're going to get out of it and the benefits they're going to get out of it and what money they're going to save or generate by having your product. Now, there's some things that are difficult to fit in this category. For the apparel solution here with the sock, in large part, they're going to be driven by competing prices. What do customers pay for things that are similar? For other sites, or other concepts, if you're helping customers make money, one of your determinants on determining what you should price it is how much money am I helping them make? 
when you look at electric vehicles, when you look at two of the same vehicles, a plug-in Prius versus a non-plug-in Prius, a plug-in Ford Fusion sedan versus a gas-powered Ford Fusion, you might be paying a 20%, 25% premium to get the plug-in version where I could run in all-electric mode and save money on gas. And part of the reason that they get to, we're going to charge you that amount more, part of it's the technology and it costs a bit more to make, but a big piece of it is how much is it going to save you in gas, and they know that you're going to do the math when you decide, do I buy one versus the other? So they have that factored in as part of the pricing equation as well. We also see it in somewhat of an a la carte method for lots of websites and software, and this is a site called Basecamp that does project management. They have a $50 version. They have a $100 version. They have a $150 version. And they are differentiated by the number of projects, the volume of data. Some other sites might be differentiated by the number of users. <clears throat> so there are different ways in which they have segmented their market and have customer-oriented pricing. Why not just have one? Why not pick the middle? $100 a month, here's what it is. Why not just roll with that? You might need either more or less features. There might be people that want more and are willing to pay more. There might be people that want less, and while your feature set would serve them, they don't want to pay that amount if they want less. So if three options are good, why not have 10 options? And 35 projects is $49. And 36 projects are $50. And 37 projects is $51. Gets to be overcomplicated. What do we do if we go on a store, we need to buy some black shoelaces, and there are 45 different types of black shoelaces? All at different price points. You get frustrated, you likely will leave with nothing because you don't want to buy the cheap ones and they're no good. You don't want to buy the expensive ones and have wasted money. And if it's unclear on really what the difference is, you might go somewhere else. So you don't want to alienate people. You don't want to overcomplicate it. But pending your product, you might be able to have something that's visible. With the socks, you're probably not going to sell somebody half a sock. <clears throat> it probably is what it is. And that's okay. How might they differentiate? If you have a $10 pair of socks, how can they differentiate how they sell? By pricing. Assume you think $10 is the right price. And they do other things. Let me ask it a different way. Would they give a discount? Like maybe if you sold three pairs like at a time. Okay. There's maybe some bulk. So in that way, maybe you can't necessarily differentiate by feature, but we're accustomed to differentiating price by quantity. So one pair is $10. You can buy a three-pack for $20. Would they ever sell it for six? If you want to buy a hundred pair, we'll sell it for six dollars. Who would buy a hundred pair? Retailers. So maybe their wholesale price is six dollars, and then people can retail that, or you sell it to teams. You sell it to groups of people, and in that way you're selling in mass. And the logic is that I'm probably saving marketing to an extent by selling in a big pack. I'm also, again, getting a lot of money now and a lot of money early, which is typically to the advantage of startups. So think about to what extent you can do bulk sales or group sales as well, and that might change your pricing a bit. That falls into this area of thinking about different segments. You might have a price point for a single-use, one-time user. You might have pricing for wholesale partners that are going to retail it after that. You might have a 
company price that people are going to buy them in volume. So it's more than just a single price point. You might have three or four or five different prices for the same product. How do you know what it cost? So for our, let's go back to the e-scooters. So maybe $1,800 is your target price. I think I can sell this for $1,800. What's it going to cost you to have these things made? How do you figure that out? How do you figure that out? Yep. The cost of the materials that you can start looking at pieces and say, well, if I'm going to assemble this, would I buy a gas-powered scooter minus the motor? And will somebody sell me that? And then can I buy an electric motor? And then can I buy a battery and bolt these things together? What else could you do? Yep. Make your own from scratch. You could start from the basics of saying, I'm going to buy plastic. I'm going to buy aluminum. And I'm going to build each part. Or is there something in the middle where maybe I need to build the frame, but then I'm buying tires and I'm buying the other pieces to put in this thing. So you kind of have to decide, what is it you're going to do? What are you going to do as a firm? And what makes sense if you're doing things in a software and an app space as a few as you are how do you know what that cost oh we looked it up but for your product well they have specifics like you can add into the cost if you need a um, it to be compatible with advertising if you want to search bar if you okay so you found a provider and this is an example of where you can find such things, you find a provider that does it. You ask someone. You get quotes. You get someone that does what you need done, and this is a site where you can find programmers and designers and writers and other creative types, and you give them some sense of, in general, this is what I'm looking for, and you get quotes. No different than if you want to put a roof in your house or replace a muffler on your car you go to a few people that you think are credible and reputable based on your research and you get quotes and you decide who do I want to go with what's it cost to get a quote Not free. generally free why free they want your business they want you as a client so they're happy, typically, to tell you what they charge. What do you do when they say it's going to cost $15,000 to build your app? You, go somewhere else. you can say, no, thank you. You can say, I can pay 10 You can negotiate either what does it cost to build what you said you wanted, and maybe you can find a price that works for you both. Or you might find they can't build what you said you wanted, but they can build something close to that for what you can afford. So there might also be some negotiation on what is the product, the feature, the function of it itself. And you arrive at something that works. You can also, again, with software, with web, there's lots of online providers, typically with many states and counties. There are organizations, companies, manufacturers, and these are, as an example, manufacturers of metal products in Maryland. So if you need fenders made for your scooter, if you need frames made for your scooter, you're probably not going to go to Home Depot, buy a blowtorch, pick up some aluminum and go back to your dorm room and start welding out frames. 
you're probably going to find somebody that does it and that does it well with the experience and the tools and the economies of scale that you can have it done. And so in that way, again, chambers of commerce at the city, county, or state levels may be a resource, too, of finding such people. Universities can be a resource as well. Why not manufacture everything abroad? Importing is expensive. There is a cost of transit. There's a cost of time. You may pay a little bit of a premium, particularly early on, to be able to go and meet and to see and to drop in and check on what's being built for your firm. Then there's the whole after-sale experience of figuring out, based on the segment that you're serving, are there contracts that you're going to be upheld to? Are there warranties? Is there some level of service after that that you want to think about as well? There may be some level of liability. You want to forecast the asset values in the future. To what degree of accuracy are you committing to? What's high? 95%. 95% accuracy. So if I have an asset that at the end of the day comes in at 94%, what do I do? What do I do? Make it so it's 95%. But you guaranteed that it would be worth 95%. Not my problem. Whose problem is it? Your problem. So what do you do? You pay me the difference. You fix my problem. So my asset happened to be an aircraft carrier. So I have a $2 billion asset. You're only 1% off. 1% of $2 billion is $20 million. So you owe me $20 million? No big deal. So be careful of what you promise. Be careful of the expectations that you set. Be careful of any implied contracts that you might be making. With this ER app, you told me I could get to the ER in three minutes with your map. It took me five minutes. My daughter died. Because I thought I had three minutes. I thought I could get there in three minutes. I live in Detroit. The average police response in Detroit, 911, 58 minutes. Really? True number. So in that way, I'm not going to wait. <coughs> but you told me five minutes. Well, I'm sorry, you told me three, took me five. You're at fault. If you use Google Maps, who's at fault? Google Maps. But you would rather me as a consumer litigate with Google, oh, yeah. argue with Google about what you said and I said and he said and she said than to argue with you for a feature that the estimated time, the map, there are maps out there, there are good maps out there. You can link to those maps. You can integrate those maps and be fine. So again, be careful about what it is that you're including. Be careful about what it is that you are expecting people to do because there might be some after sales. Maybe it makes sense when you sell it, but there may be, once it's implemented and in practice, other unintended consequences of that. And there are some companies that have tried to not only sell you a warranty, but try and sell you a buyback agreement and Best Buy, I don't know if they're still doing this, they tried it uh, for a period of time, where if you bought a mobile phone, if you bought a laptop, if you bought a TV, you could pay a little extra to sign up for this buyback program. And if you wanted to sell that product back to them, essentially trade it in on a new product, trade it in on a gift card at Best Buy, they would guarantee that they would give you a percentage of what you spent back.
and the percentages are here, if you bought your laptop, bought your TV, and then in six months you wanted a different one, they would give you up to 50% back. So I bought a laptop for 500 bucks. It's been six months. I want a new one. I take it back. I get 250 and I can spend that on a new one or anything else in Best Buy. I can spend that 250 on anything I want. If I keep it for two years, I get 20% back. So, I'm not, the price is tied in some fashion to what uh, the product cost. So, I'm not sure exactly what the prices were. Who are they trying to serve with this? People who always try to upgrade their stuff. People that want the new, people that want the latest. What are the alternatives for those people? Who are the competitors for this? It's secondary used markets, Ebay's, and the like. But what happens with eBay? Do you have to trust people you don't know? What's the model for eBay? <clears throat> I have a product. I want to sell it. What do I do? Auction. It's an auction, so I put it up. Here's what it is. I do a little profile, some description, and the like. I may set a minimum bid, or I might just let it go reserves and such. And I may get what I want, may not get what I want, maybe I get much more. So there's risk inherent, but this is guaranteed and it's no hassle and I know exactly what's going to happen in the future if I want to take advantage of it. So you're not making a commitment to sell it back if you don't want to at that time, but you're buying the right to. It's an option in financial terms. So in that way you buy the right to sell this back to them at a predetermined price. I haven't heard a lot about it lately. I don't know if it's still around. But an interesting model and somewhat innovative in that space. When we too think about technology and pricing, it changes. The early Kindles, 359. And in time, they got cheaper and new ones came out that were better. So you see this again happen with technology and this is what I was referencing before. Markets change, products change, competitors change, and your pricing will change. And in the technology space it'll change with some frequency. And you look for new revenue streams. You see Amazon and Kindle selling hardware. You see them making a lot more profit, I would expect, on the TVs and the movies and the games and the other digital assets. And you also want to think about what are you selling. In some cases, you might sell a product. You pay, you get, and the transaction's done. You own it forever. You might buy it and direct download. So you pay a price that may not be that different than the physical asset, but for you as the entrepreneur, you would rather sell a digital download in many cases, provided that you can manage the piracy concerns, than to have to have physical product. And if they buy it directly from you, instead of via a third-party retailer, you make all of the price that the consumer pays. You don't have to share any of that with the retailer. There's also the option of time-delayed things. And so these are all from the video game market. You might pay $15 for 30 days. You might pay in the other example. So again, you're paying $15 for 30 days of access and use. Or you can pay $77 for 180 days. So three times, I'm sorry, six times at a discount for bulk ordering. So in that way, 30 times 6 is the 180, but roughly 5 times 15 is the 75. So you get a little bit more when you buy in bulk. Lots of different models you can choose from as you think about what makes sense for your pricing. There are promotions. You can discount. You can discount for a period of time. You can do trials. 
So think about all of these elements as well. So in summary, when we look at pricing, it's a complex equation. It's a complex question. It requires us to understand the current and future customers, current and future competitors, and the desires and plans of both. Customer-oriented pricing may make sense to us in that it certainly is an opportunity to think about the value that we're delivering based on the product life cycle and the R&D stage that we're at. Pricing strategies also require some constant attention and some constant evaluation and refinement. And in that way, the market is going to react and evolve in time, and your pricing is going to need to do that as well.